There's a price to pay on the hog pen trail, but there's also a price to pay if you're gonna serve God like you want to and flow in the things of God like you want to. But it's an easy price. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The reason most preachers and, and ministers wear out and get into sin is because they're operating out of their flesh instead of out of their spirit. Because your Bible says the spirit of a man shall sustain all of his infirmity. So if you are full of the Holy Ghost, that mind which is in Christ Jesus dwells in you richly. And that same spirit, not a different spirit, not part of that spirit, that same spirit that invaded the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, raised to life again, the three day dead body of the Prince of God now resides personally present in you. So tell me how you gonna fail. That's how he was able to say, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's how he was able to say, the works that I, Jesus, do shall you do. Now, but see, everybody stops there. The works that I do shall you do. And everybody says, I'm going to do the works of Jesus. Well, now, wait a minute. You've got to finish the verse. The works that I do shall you do and greater works. Next word, because. In other words, he's about to define why you and I will be able to do greater works than Jesus. Now let's pause right there because he was a leper cleanser. He was a blind eye healer. At the tomb of Lazarus, he was resurrection power. Huh? At the widow of Nain's son had passed. Your son, Alexander, was born what? I'm a, 10 weeks early. 10 weeks early. And the prognosis was not good. But you held on to your faith with bulldog tenacity. Yes. And you would not let go. And you opened your mouth, Psalm 81 10, with a mighty decree. And God said to you, I will fulfill it now. You'll see the words that you say, so shall it be. This spoke he concerning the spirit. Now, Jesus said, you'll do greater works than he would do because. Now, until you get connected to what comes after the because, you will never flow in works, much less greater works. Because Jesus, I God, just stay here with me a minute. You're anointed. <laughs> the first New Testament prophetic word concerning Jesus <clears throat> is that he would thoroughly purge his floor. I wonder how many folks we'd have if we opened up the building and we said, now everybody come that needs a purging. No, they don't want to know about the threshing floor. They don't want to know about servanthood. But Jesus said, the works that I do. Now you can't change the Bible, Dr. Doolittle. You, I don't care if you got enough degrees after your name, you look like alphabet soup. Most of them not real to begin with. Somebody told me the other day, uh, they said it was a preacher and they had so-and-so PhD. I said, when did you get your PhD? Oh, it's honorary, they said. Well, there's no such thing as an honorary PhD. There are honorary doctorates, but there are not honorary PhDs. So you just tell on yourself that you're living a lie and who wants to listen to folks supposed to be preaching the truth that are living a lie. That's right, that's right, Pastor. I wish I had half a church. So he said now on this Pentecost Sunday, 
He said, the works that I do, shall you do. He didn't say maybe, but he gave the qualification. And it didn't have anything to do with us, it had something to do with him. Because I go to my father. Now, wouldn't that be good news? Jesus said, you're gonna do amazing works. God bless you, deuces, I'm out of here. But he knew something we don't know. He said, it is expedient. That's a big old word. Let me catch you up with it. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I go not away, the Holy Ghost will not come. But if I go, I will send you another comforter, one like me in every essential detail and quality. And he that is now with you, meaning Jesus, shall be in you. Not some third watered down, four times removed by a marriage cousin. The same spirit that invaded that borrowed tomb and raised Jesus from the dead. Can you imagine? All hell was working against him. Every demon hissing, every serpent spewing, Satan at his desk trying to calculate a way to keep him in that tomb. Now I knew that Lazarus had come out in four days, but not Jesus. Jesus not going to be upstaged by human. So on the third morning, as Mary and the other Mary came for to see the sepulcher, there was a great earthquake. And the angel of the Lord descended from heaven. His countenance was like lightning. His raiment was white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and fell as dead men. It looked like the first Benny Hinn meeting. <laughs> but there was a great old big OBGYN gynecologist angel dispatched from heaven. He returned to heaven and he said, there's a problem. There's a stone in the birth canal. So your Bible said he threw the stone away. We act like he could barely move it. They never did find the thing. He threw it to the backside of the universe and out came walking the living, resurrected, purified, holy, been to hell, defeated hell, grabbed the devil by the nape of the neck, cast him off his imperial throne, put one foot on devils, the other on the crumbling empire of death, lifted his hands to the Father and shouted, I am Alpha, I am Omega, the first and the last. Locked the keys of death, hell, and the grave to the wheels of his chariot and went riding across the sun-baked walls of the devil's perdition, singing the very first chorus. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we're free at last. That resurrection purchased the because for us. He was seen above 40 days of his disciples. Wanted to make everybody aware he got up. But he said, no, 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 don't touch me because I've not been back to my father. Can you imagine what would have happened had they touched him? You can't handle that kind of glory. But I got a prophecy for you. There is a revival begun during COVID-19, which is destined to spring into a mighty awakening 
around the world and what used to knock little bunny foo-foo in the floor when somebody laid hands on them, you're going to have to learn to wear that anointing like a coat. You're going to walk around in what used to put you on the floor. I wish I had half a church. Now y'all pray for me. I forget people are in here. We got a few of our leaders in here today. You can be seated any time you'd like. Ah, hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. Now y'all pray. There's nothing wrong with my vocal cords except uh, slight overuse. Ah, blessed be God forever. Now I've preached certainly this many times in a row. In fact, I used to preach 40 nights straight during resurrection seed. I used to preach all the services here and I preached 200 nights a year somewhere else in America for over 25 years. But I haven't been exactly right here with you all that time, you see. I have an apostolic anointing and it takes me around the world many, many, many times. And so I want to thank the great leadership of this amazing local church in Columbus, Ohio, our branch campus in Elkhart, Indiana, men like my pastor, the incomparable senior elder, Bill Canfield, we love you so desperately. And all the great men and women that serve here. Well, we began this whole thing on Friday night. I hope you were with me on Friday night. It was one of the most important messages I've ever delivered, I believe that. It, was, it, it involved itself with the abdication of the Holy Spirit. The abdication of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? He's been asked to leave. It means the modern church thinks it can exist without the Holy Spirit. Now we all know that's error, but they don't know it's error. They need to be reminded what the great Leonard Ravenhill said. He said the reason the world goes to hellfire is because the church has lost Holy Ghost fire. Shout, except me. Now, I'm an audience participation preacher, so you got to let me know you're participating. There are no spectators. There are only participants. So let me know right in there in all those comments, whether you're on YouTube or you're on Facebook or you're on Instagram or you're at rodparsley.tv or, or you're on YouTube. It doesn't matter where you are. I want to hear from you. Put your prayer requests in there. I go through, and there are tens of thousands of them, but my family will tell you, I go through every single one of those comments. I pray over every prayer request. I don't just have you do it to throw it out there in the air. I have you do it to get connected to this anointing. Because the anointing that you serve is the anointing you are worthy to receive from. If you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, then you release that prophet's reward. Most folk have no idea what the prophet's reward is. Well, I can tell you what it is. Something you lost is on its way back, but it's not coming back the way you lost it. I wish I had a, just a shout from anybody. I think we've forgotten silence is the language of defeat, but shouting is the language of victory. Clapping is the language of authority. Running is the language of freedom. Leaping is the language of joy. Hallelujah. And then last night we shared with you regarding the affect of the Holy Spirit. We're going to move on from that today. I'm going to talk to you about the absolute authority. Oh, I'm, I told you I know where I'm going. So if I get a shout before you get a book, just hang on with me. We're living in a day, Dr. Lowell, of a powerless 
Pentecost. We got more playboys than prophets. We got more compromise than conviction. <laughs> uh, we, we live in a time where Pentecost is relegated to the home Bible study group if we mention the Holy Spirit at all. Uh, we live in a time where preaching about the Holy Spirit has become the rule and not the exception, you see. We need the one who promised to condescend to come and indwell mortals to fill us full of himself. Not religion, full of himself. Mm. But first, we better count the cost. Though Pentecost meant power to the disciples, it also meant prison. Are you ready to go? We can't get some of you to midweek service. We sure enough can't get you to prayer service. But you say you die for Jesus. Well, would you go to prison for Jesus? Would you be slandered and mocked? Would you have rotten eggs thrown at you? How long would you continue your music ministry if only 14 people showed up to hear you sing and they only showed up to mock you? Would you still lift up his name? Would you still shout? Would you still rejoice? This thing called Pentecost could mean prison to you. It meant endowment with mighty power from on high, but it also meant being rejected by the religious organizations of their day. Pentecost brought the favor of God while at the same time producing the hatred of men. Pentecost brought great miracles. It also presented great obstacles. Driving through the city streets, I've often wondered why we have to hang a sign outside our church to announce that we are Pentecostal. I think it's because the sign outside is the only sign most folks will ever see. Because when they come through the door into the sanctuary, the only sign they find there is a backslidden preacher who's afraid or ashamed to speak with other tongues, lest it offend somebody in his little social club that used to be called the Pentecostal church. Or more importantly, if someone spoke in tongues, it might offend someone of influence in their congregation or their national television audience. It might interrupt the flow of the increase of their social media likes and followers. Oh, I'm coming. I noticed something though. In Bridge of Hope, we often are first responders to places where tornadoes have leveled cities, neighborhoods, two miles wide, 30 miles long, nothing left but little pieces of wood. And when I was on one of those trips, I thought about that. I thought about if you pass through a town that's been torn apart by a tornado, you won't have to ask anybody. You'll know that a mighty, mighty wind has cleared that place. You see, a fire is self-announcing because we no longer pray in tongues in private. We have no power in public. Our emptiness of heaven's language makes us void of an earthly word. We have the best of press skinny suits but we no longer pierce the heavens with our prayers. We have a shout in the sanctuary, but no clout in the spirit. We claim authority, but we take no meaningful ground. We write songs about victory over evil, more suitable for the playground than the battlefield. We have become proficient in the dialect of men and void of the voice of heaven. Many who claim they've experienced the mighty baptism in the Holy Ghost are more dead than alive, more off than on, more wrong than right. 
Oh, we got a lot of them that are spirit frilled, but very few that have actually been spirit filled. We become so accustomed to the world show on our platforms. We become so accustomed to dwelling on the outer fringe of God's presence that we no longer recognize the inner essence of God's mighty power. Now, whenever evil, like today, mires the work of God, our flesh, everybody shout at me flesh. flesh. Type it in there, flesh. Whenever evil mires the work of God, our flesh always, always, always reasserts itself. When the Holy Spirit is abdicated, the flesh is welcomed. If you are not filled, something will fill the void. If the Holy Spirit doesn't rule and reign in your local church congregation, something else will fill that void. And it will not be holy. Our lack of fruit condemns our prayerless, powerless, passionless Christianity. What we need is another deluge. We need another mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Pentecostal power. On the day of Pentecost, Peter prayed for 10 days and he preached for 10 minutes. Today, we pray for 10 minutes and preach for 10 days. No wonder we have so many failures. The Holy Spirit today is more ignored than denied, which is worse. Tweet that. I think God's people are ready though. I don't know how he, I'll know here directly by your response. I, I think God's, God's people have had enough. I think they're ready to lose their dignity for some Holy Ghost demonstration. I think they're ready to trade their degrees for some revelation. I think they're ready to trade their marketing for some miracles, their reputation for repentance, and their tongues of poison for tongues of fire. So we're going to move on now. From last night, we dealt mainly with point number one, that being Romans 8, 1 and 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has, past tense, made me free from the law of sin and death. What is the law of sin? The soul that sinneth, your Bible says, shall die. Now let me ask you a question. Because in the modern church, what we have a propensity to do is bring a man to an altar who abuses his wife. We have him make a decision and fill out a card. Then we have lazy church folk follow him up, try to get him drugged back to church. Then we get him in next steps or last steps or first steps or in between steps so we can have him become an usher. And then we do not understand why he does not pray, why he does not tithe, why he does not serve, why you cannot depend upon him. I'm about to tell you why. We preach a faulty gospel, therefore we have faulty conversions. Nobody, when I was eight years of age in a Pentecostal church as a Baptist boy with a two by six seat to sit on and a dirt floor and a 45 watt light bulb hanging down on its own cord with a chain that you turned it on with after I gave my life to Christ after he made me a new creation what nobody had to invite me back to the well where I found the river of life y'all are preaching me 
why, why do we have to waste good tithe dollars that could be preaching the gospel around the world to pay staff that won't half work half the time. Somebody asked me the other day, said, how many people work at World Harvest? I said, about half of them. That's funny, I don't care who you are, Elder. <laughs> about half of them. Here's the issue. That which is born of flesh. Maybe it's the light show. I don't know. Maybe it's the music. I don't know. Maybe it's that, that business CEO pastor type. I don't know what attracted them. Maybe it was the carnival going on outside. I don't know. But I know this, if all of that is done without the apex of all Christian endeavor becoming to place the jewel of a soul in the crown of our Savior, we are all wasting our time and God is not in our services because he does not participate in trying to get people born again by the flesh because what becomes born of flesh remains flesh. Oh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Jesus said, marvel not that I say to you, you must be born again of the Spirit. I'm talking about total, complete, absolute, overwhelming, undeniable, irreversible transformation. I'm not talking about you made a decision. This, okay, I love y'all. I, I love everybody. Just say that, Pastor Rod loves everybody. This thing we call the born again experience is not, underline not, a journey. If I hear one more person, well, this is my journey. Do you know what that, let me translate that for you. I still want to sin, but I came to an altar, <clears throat> I abused my wife. You prayed a little two minute prayer with me, filled out a card and signed me up for next steps. But inside, I'm no different. So with my mind, I attempt to do better because I go to church now. Do you know that the power of the Holy Ghost to convict your heart and save you from your sin is not a 12-step program? We tell people they're saved who are not and then try to teach them how to be better people. Here's how you can be blessed. Here's how you can get more money. Here's how you can have a happier life now. Why do I want this to be my best life? If, this, if you think this is your best life, you ain't never heard about heaven. I'm just in a dressing room down here. The time is coming when I will shed this flesh suit and go winging my way into the palaces and pavilions of God's glory to suffer, sigh, cry, die no more. I can't, I can't. If any man be in Christ, what happens? He becomes a new creature. That actually translates a new species of being that has never existed before. When you get up from that altar, your family shouldn't recognize you. Your friends shouldn't recognize you. 
when you driving home in your car and look in your rear view mirror, you ought to be asking who that is staring back at you. Everything will feel different. Everything will look different because everything will be different. Everything has changed because everything changed. Let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about the authority. Shout authority of the Holy Spirit. That doesn't tell me what I need to know. Uh, excuse me. Having received the spirit of life, let's say we're to that point. Secondly, we become acquainted with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, we will learn how to walk uh, in the spirit live in the spirit move in the spirit if we do not move in him we do not move at all like branches without sap we are withered like a sailing ship without the wind we are paralyzed like chariots without horses to draw them we are stationary we are sedentary there's no movement there's no action there's no progress we're the same you know, if they put a monitor on your natural heart and that line stays like this, you're dead. It's the same in the spirit. If you're staying even, you're dead. The path of the righteous. You heard my daughter up here quoting it to you. The path of the righteous grows brighter and brighter, not dimmer and dimmer. And we are changed from glory into glory as by the Spirit of the Lord. I. Woo. Uh, now, notice that I said the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because... Most folks don't know anything about the gift of the Holy Spirit. They've heard a little bit about the gifts, plural, of the Holy Spirit. Let's dig a little bit deeper. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 is where your Bible says, The Lord God formed a man of the dust of the ground. And then he did something very interesting. He picked up that lifeless hunk of clay at the river on creation's dawning day. He picked him up and your Bible said he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. I don't have time to take you through the whole thing. Suffice it to say that Acts chapter two is a replay of Genesis chapter two. In the beginning, God breathed his breath into man's nostrils. On the day of Pentecost, a rushing mighty wind came. Wind and breath in your Bible are synonymous. In fact, your Bible says there are four winds of God. They are connected to the transliteration of the name of God, yod heh wah -Heh. yod heh wah -Heh, the great Jewish theologian Josephus said, were not four consonants, but four vowels. Yod Hey, Wah Hey. They became Yahweh and then from there progressed to Jehovah. Now, when Josephus looked at this thing, he said, These are not consonants, these are vowels. I've got enough people here, and you join me right there where you are. Tell me your vowels. Look at those children over there talking to me. 
Sometimes why? Everybody's got always the win. Sometimes why? A E I O U Y. Say it with me together. Say it again, one more time, really loud at home. Why did your tongue never touch your teeth? A E I O U. Why, why did your lips never close? Because vows represent the breath of God when they are yod he wah Are you listening to me? So when he breathed in, when he breathed into that man, he breathed who and what he was into Adam, and Adam became a living soul, made imagio Dei in the image of God, spirit, soul, and body, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Gabriel, Michael, Lucifer, inner court, outer court, holy of holies. But all by the Spirit. So then, the purpose of God for the mighty baptism in the Holy Spirit is that the Lord Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, would live and inhabit us in a more real way, I'm gonna shock you now, than when Jesus walked the earth. Missed. I'll use this. Are y'all bored? Are you bored online? That's who I'm talking to. This Bible is like you. It's an oblong cube, but it has three dimensions. Everything in the known universe has three dimensions. It has height, it has width, and it has depth. You have height, some of us a whole lot more width, and not a lot of depth. But nonetheless, we are three-dimensional beings. The reason God co created us in three dimensions is because he created us to live in the natural world where everything is three dimensions. The problem with the incarnation, and for you to ever understand the Holy Spirit, you must first discern the incarnation. Incarnation, big word, simply means Emmanuel. Another big word, God with us. God condescending to leave his heavenly a spiritual estate and come to the earth, born of a 14 year old virgin girl while angels sang happy birthday and angels showed up to see if it was true. But now watch this. When Jesus was born, he came into three dimensions, just like you. Man was created in the image or a reflection of God. Think about a mirror. That's how we were created, a reflection of God. You better stay with me. A reflection of God in his image, but not him. We got a whole lot of false new age doctrine going around that says you are a God. You are not a God, you will never be a God, and to say so is blasphemous. Now then, that's the kind of theology you get at Valor Christian College. There it is. 
But now what happens if I hold this three-dimensional Bible up in front of a mirror? What about if I take a picture of it? What if I create a drawn image of it? How many dimensions does that reflection of this three-dimensional being have? It only has two. It has height and width. It can't have depth. It only has two. A single dimension. What happened to the other dimension? Well, if God had created you exactly like him, then you would have been God, which you are not. You are a reflection of God. So there is something missing in man of the fullness of God. God is that spirit. You can't see it. You can't hear it. But you can see the effect of it. Ah, that's how you're supposed to live. This was the problem with the incarnation. God only left Jesus here 33 and a half years so he could show us how God operated through humanity. But just as soon as he could, he got him up out of here. Why? Because if you see Jesus as the totality of God, you are limiting who God is. That's why he said, if you get full of the Holy Ghost, the works he did will you do but greater. <laughs> Woo! God on the day of Pentecost replaced a holy man <laughs> with a Holy Ghost. Jesus said, he that is now with you shall be in you. Here's the problem with the incarnation. If Jesus was in Galilee and you were in Samaria, he couldn't do anything for you. His best friend Lazarus died. Now that'll tell you something that uh, it rains on the just and the unjust. Bible says, Lazarus, who you love, Jesus, died. B bad things happen to good people. Whew, that felt good. Here it is. Lazarus, whom you love, has died. So Jesus then went to where Lazarus was and raised him from the dead. Why? Because he wasn't in that location. But now a spirit. <clears throat> an anointed servant of God, full of the Holy Ghost, can right now speak God's word. And wherever you are, you'll be healed. We saw a vision of that when Jesus came to the centurion and the centurion said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. Speak a word only. Why? Word and spirit agree. Jesus said, it is expedient for you that means to your advantage that I go away because if I don't go away, you're going to focus on my image and miss who I am. That's why he said, don't touch me. He's now in that glorified body. Hey. He's now in that body which will never know decay. He was tempted in every area like as we are, but yet without sin. 
having the fullness of the Spirit in him as a human. Now then, he said, what's in me that is with you about to get in y'all. Now, he's not just in Nazareth, he's in Samaria too. He's not just at your house, he's at my house. I take him with me wherever I go, he is. There is a reason why your Bible and mine say that all of heaven rejoices over one sinner that has come home or been saved. Why is that? Did you ever think about it? When you get my age, questions haunt you. Why is it? Why is it? that that is so. I perceive that it is because God, our Father, has just secured another body into which dispense His Holy Ghost a place for His Son to live. Do you know that's who lives in you now? By the power of the Holy Ghost right now, right now, he is alive in you by his spirit. So just sit there and act like you don't have any fire shut up in your bones. <laughs> Just sit there and act like he's not alive in you. Now I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you one more thing. Man must be a companionable partner. You remember in your Bible, I'm just about finished. Do you remember in your Bible, I know you do, Dr. Lowe, I, where God said, it is not good for a man to be alone. So he made him a help me. In other words, the DNA which is in us of the spirit is made for companionship. 99 and 9 tenths percent of human persons who are isolated become sick. Over 90% of people isolated for more than 30 days become clinically depressed. That's why the most grotesque form of punishment in the penal institutions is to put one in solitary confinement. Loneliness, this is, this, this is very poignant right now during this Wuhan Corona-19 virus. It's very, it's very prominent, it's in the front of everybody's thinking. There's a debate between should we have more deaths by the virus and open up or should we stay closed up and let our economy further go into the trenches from which we may never recover? Because the argument is not only about the economy, but it's suicide is up, depression is up, murder is up, violent crime is up. Thank you, Ms. Patty. Spousal and child abuse are off the page right now. And those are tragedies of being alone. Yeah, yeah. 
because loneliness will kill you. To which our father responds, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I am a friend that sticks closer than a brother. When everybody else walks out, the Holy Ghost walks in. You will never, ever be alone again. The God of the eternal ages, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb of God, the I am that I am, Jehovah Sidkenu, your righteousness, Jehovah Makedesh, your holiness. Oh, hallelujah, I sense his presence right now. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. We worship you. Abba, we belong to you. Lord Jesus, we worship you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Come and fill us now. Fill our minds. Fill our hearts. Fill our present. Fill our future. Fill our homes. Fill us with yourself. Now may the presence of the Holy Spirit invade every part and portion of your being, your home and your automobile, your thoughts, your deepest desires, your inward passions, those things that you only dream about. May the Holy Spirit come now and convince you of sin and convince you of healing and liberty and power and strength and might and dominion and authority by the power of the Holy Spirit come to you now. I rebuke loneliness. I rebuke emptiness. I rebuke a wandering spirit. I rebuke every spirit but the Holy Spirit and I declare and decree on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Jehovah Joshua Messiah, whose I am and whom I serve, be filled. Be filled now with the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' mighty name. Now take a deep breath in and let it out with a mighty hallelujah. 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 I rebuke loneliness. I rebuke weariness. I rebuke fear. I rebuke anger. I rebuke wrath. Be gone now. I rebuke every bondage and every hindrance for the fullness of the life of Christ by the Holy Spirit to be lived in you, by you, and through you. Who oh, be glorified, Lord. Be glorified, Lord. Well, I got through number two. I left three hanging out there in the wind. I'll jump on it the next time. Not sure you were ready for that one anyway. Walking in the Spirit. Now you shout about that part, but let me finish it. And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That that's born of flesh is flesh. That that's born of spirit is spirit. Paul said there's a warfare going on. When I would do good, evil's present. Now some folk think you're supposed to get born again, baptized in water and filled with the Holy Ghost. And after that, you no longer have a sin problem. The fact of the matter is your sin problem just got magnified. God is going to begin to put his finger on everything in your life. Not some legalism, not some silliness, Here's the deal. Sanctification 
is the work of the Holy Spirit. Its end result is holiness. Now everybody's already going to their clothesline. You know, used to be a time, and I wasn't even a Pentecostal, but in the Baptist church, if a woman came into church with toeless shoes on, she was not allowed to come in the sanctuary. There was something unholy about toes. <clears throat> As a boy, I never could quite figure it out. And my elders said, well, we don't want women being provocative and, and causing men to lust. To which I replied, if a man is lusting after a woman's ugly toes, the man's got the problem, not the woman. We need to deal with the man. That's how silly, silly things become. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna preach and teach to you what real sanctification is, what real holiness is, and how you can walk in it every day. But you'll have to join me next Sunday if you want to be a part of it. I sure do love you. Let's give God a great big hallelujah for these three days of fire.